Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to be starting a panel here on personalized data that's driving new immersive in-vehicle experiences. Um, on the panel with me today, we have Harman, Amazon Auto, Emergency Safety Solutions, and uh, moderated by myself, uh, Ted from Stanson Ventures. So we're going to turn it over to Harman first, um, just to kind of talk about some of the macro trends they're seeing on the connectivity side. Roger? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Roger Jollis. I'm head of product management at Harman Automotive. And uh, I'm uh, in the, uh, what we call the telematics group, which is now uh, being renamed the connectivity because it's going beyond telematics. I had a, a slide up here, and I think we can all agree that there is a set of mega trends on uh, board right now in the industry. And uh, it's abbreviated CASE, connectivity, autonomy, um, shared mobility and electrification, and they're all in a different phase of, of rolling out, but you know, maybe I'm just too close to it, but I believe connectivity is a very, 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 very big piece of that, and it's going to enable the other uh, capabilities that we see. As we move into the second decade, and it's even in some cases happening before that, we're going to see cars be defined uh, by software, software that will be delivered potentially as a feature on demand and delivered over the air. What I'm going to talk about today is where we're going beyond 5G. And we hear about 5G all the time, and yes, it's coming. In fact, the first 5G-enabled car was launched by uh, BMW just this year uh, with the Harman and Samsung um, uh, modem in it. Uh, there are more that are coming out between now and uh, 2025. In fact, almost every single... Um, uh, automotive manufacturers looking at 5G uh, coming in within the next uh, five to six years. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, this is um, sort of the way we see it. Um, obviously, the 5G telecommunications control unit is the heart of the communication today and will continue to be an important piece of, um, of the communication structure. And of course, what does 5G bring? And a lot of people ask me, well, why do I need it uh, today? What's this going to do that 4G can't do? What it brings is low latency, latency being the delay between the request for the service and the return of the service. And that's going to enable some really, really interesting safety applications. And it will become important as we move into the era of uh, autonomous vehicles as well. Of course, we always hear about the big bandwidth that's available in 5G. Um, you know, the initial systems coming in at about a gigabit or a little bit more but uh, we will see a transformation off of the lower frequencies, lower wavelengths, lower spectrums into the millimeter waves, and we'll see uh, throughputs of up to 10 gigabytes. And this will enable many, many more new applications. As we become autonomous, the demand for data in vehicles is going to become just uh, you know, phenomenal. And so 5G will be able to handle this. But there are other things going on as well. The next one you hear about is vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to everything. Uh, this is uh, V2X, and uh, this is peer-to-peer -peer communications primarily for safety, but you'll also be seeing other services being delivered from the roadside to the vehicle and information transmitted from the vehicle to the roadside, eventually potentially uplinked to the 5G network and down to mobile phones that are carried by bike, biking people and, and pedestrians to provide some safety uh, functionality there as well. Um, the other thing that's coming is what we call edge computing. This is where you move compute resources out of the cloud that's somewhere distant and close to the road, and you're able to deliver uh, new services and services on demand, uh, features on demand that can happen even without the driver, owner, operator pushing a button to say, I want this, based upon a particular context that the car and driver are in. Maybe it's based on sensors, maybe it's based on, on time of day those services can be delivered quickly, rapidly to the car, and the car becomes really much, much more personalized. So that's uh, coming. You'll see uh, mobile, mobile edge computing, multi-access edge computing, both on the roadside as well as uh, virtually in the cloud. We'll also see uh, coming in uh, what we call low Earth orbiting satellite communications. This is going to be able to provide um, much better coverage in areas where it might be marginal with 5G, especially in rural areas, and will become really, really important for uh, autonomous vehicles as well. The last thing I'd like to make a point of is all this new connectivity is going to bring some risks. It's going to bring a lot of benefits, but it's going to bring some risks. And I don't think we have to look any further than our laptops and our, our home computers to see where those risks might be. 
uh, security, cybersecurity, right now is something that consumers really don't think much about when they get into their connected car. They, they take it for granted that the automaker is protecting them against uh, these kinds of threats. Every day, just about, we're hearing of rogueware that's going out and, and locking up uh, computers and servers. And uh, this is going to become a problem in uh, the automotive world as well. You won't, you won't hear about it until it locks up you know, a good number of vehicles and, and tells the users, you're going to have to pay $10,000 to unlock your car. At that point, it's going to become very, very important. The three threat faces, we, we know about intrusion today. That's protected by the uh, walled garden of the automotive. The other is going to be malware, which includes uh, rogueware. And the third is going to be privacy. And for the automotive manufacturers, privacy is a huge risk uh, here in the United States for litigation. Uh, we've seen what happened with uh, Yahoo and, and some of the uh, retail operations. It's going to be a problem in cars as well if it's not protected. And the other one um, uh, that is going to be important is um, uh, to make sure that we can, we can uh, indemnify the, uh, the automakers so that they don't have to pay these huge fees. In Europe, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's a law. Anyway, that's sort of where we're coming from. Uh, it's exciting. A lot of new things coming down the pipe. And uh, finally, connectivity in the car is here, and it's going to enable the rest of the transformations. Roger, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to ask you a quick question. So that, um, kind of what do you think is the, the biggest takeaway for this? So um, complicated technology, security, things are getting more connected. Um, for, for the audience kind of listening that might not be as technical or in the weeds, what do you, what do you think is the one thing they should take away from the connectivity approach? Like from your point of view from Harman, like, hey, you should pay attention to this. Is there one thing you'd, you'd sum it up as? Roger, sorry, for you, Roger? So that was for me. <laughs> yes. What are we going to take away from the connectivity? Well, what's going to take away? Well, the takeaway is connectivity is going to enable personalization. The data has to come in and go out of the car from somewhere, and we're connecting pervasively, and that will allow you to really personalize your in-vehicle experience. And we have a, a slogan at Harman, experiences per mile. That's, all about what, that's what it's all about, making sure you have the best experiences in your, in your vehicle. Okay, great. We're going to um, come back to that. We're just going to kind of go down the line here and then jump into more questions. Um, so Luke from uh, Amazon Auto. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Luke Harvey. I'm a uh, principal partner solution architect at Amazon Web Services. Um, my role at, at AWS is really enabling our customers and our partners to achieve their business objectives leveraging the cloud. Um, AWS is the most broadly adopted cloud platform. We have millions of customers, and those customers include global automotive OEMs, tier ones, and even the most innovative startups that are leveraging the cloud. In automotive, we really see a transformation that's occurring right now. Um, you know, that's driven by a couple different mega trends that we have. One of them is hyper-connectivity. Uh, vehicles, you know, we're seeing the, the mass adoption of connectivity in vehicles. Those vehicles themselves are sending more and more data. There's more and more use cases that are driving more and more need for cloud adoption. Uh, another one of them is electrification, so powertrain electrification. And it's not just the vehicle electrification, but there's the infrastructure as well, right? Um, when you're driving a vehicle and it's an electric vehicle, uh, you may need to know where those charging stations are. You want to know what the statuses of them are. You want to know that information in real time. And you know, that's driving more and more use cases if you start thinking about you know, the other areas that that drives as well. The other area is autonomous and, and um, you know, ADAS systems. So autonomous and ADAS systems obviously are connected vehicles, but they're also driving new use cases where you need to have uh, you know, very high-scale computing in the vehicle. Once you have that in the, in the vehicle at the edge, you need to manage that data. You need to manage all the sensors in the vehicle as well. And then finally, the other really big trend that we're seeing is you know, sharing economy. So now that you're um, investing heavily in your infrastructure, you have these ADAS and connected vehicles, how can you leverage them? How can you get your return on investment of all these expensive technologies? And you know, the shared uh, economy is really enabling that. So we're seeing these different you know, transformative uh, you know, trends in the auto industry. But really, the other thing that's in there is a consumer mindset shift. So you know, consumers are used to having that personalized experience. They have their cell phone. Now, the, the cell phone is a little different than an automobile, right? So your, your vehicle that you buy, the life cycle is 15, you know, 20 years. 
But, and also the interesting thing about a vehicle is you may not be the only driver, right? Your phone you have for a couple years, you're the only driver of that device. However, those experiences, those mobile experiences that are personalized, consumer mindset and expectation is that those are gonna follow them into the vehicle as well. So that's really driving a lot of this, uh, you know, foundational shift in automotive expectations. So at, at AWS, um, we're really focused on a couple strategic areas. And those areas kind of can be broken down into one of them being product solutions. So I mentioned connected vehicle cloud. We're seeing increased adoption of 5G use cases, uh, leveraging some of the technologies that 5G brings to the, the connected vehicle cloud. We're seeing, obviously, things like over-the-air software updates. But the really interesting thing about this is in the software divine vehicle uh, use cases that we're seeing. Now that we have these very high-powered computers in the system, you can start thinking about vehicles as actually being edge data centers, right? They have a lot of uh, more CPU cores, they have a lot more memory, a lot more resources, and we're seeing architectures shift from a, dis you know, a disparate uh, set of ECUs down to consolidated uh, you know, domain zonal architectures that then could be managed um, and interfaced with the cloud. Uh, the other one is autonomous driving development. So the interesting thing about AD and ADAS development is that it's a new kind of paradigm for development, so software development. You need now things like you know, big data lakes to be able to manage all the data and the sensors and all the information that you've collected from your vehicles. And you also need things like machine learning operations or ML ops and other advanced you know, DevOps platforms that are needed to actually develop and deploy and deliver these autonomous systems. You know, the cloud is, is a pretty good place for, uh, for all of that. Um, and then also digital customer experience. So I just talked previously about you know, the cell phone experience and what customers are expecting as far as you know, bringing personalization into their vehicle. But this extends to the sales cycle as well. Um, personally, myself, um, you know, the last vehicle that I sold, I sold online with a click of a button. I got a quote. Someone came and picked up my car and handed me a check. Right? That experience is a completely digital experience for selling a car, but I've also done the same thing with my last car purchase. I picked it up online, I didn't go in to see it. Um, you know, I actually was able to schedule a test drive to go test a similar car, but you know, I made the purchase sight unseen, went in, and the whole experience was just seamless and I really enjoyed it. So that digital customer engagement, um, you know, following that, that consumer around is a, is a really key aspect in the transformation that we're seeing. Um, and then as well as enterprise solutions. So I won't spend too much time on that one, but you know, obviously uh, insurance estimations, um, you know, doing some kind of new use cases around that. Tesla actually uh, announced recently that they were uh, going to roll out their FSD beta to um, you know, their consumers. And one of the metrics that they were actually using for that was their insurance algorithm. So they're determining, based on their insurance algorithm, using the data that they've collected on the drivers to determine whether or not there are risks there right before they deploy the solution. Um, and then the other thing I really wanted to focus on is the interesting thing about AWS and what makes AWS unique. And the thing that really drew me to actually, um, you know, hop on at AWS was our leadership principles. And the one that, you know, resonates the most with me is our customer obsession. AWS people love talking about our customers, and it's more than just talking about our customers. Actually, 90% of the services, the features, everything that we're adding to our services come directly from customer requests. So 90% of those requests, we're listening to their customers, and that's actually how we're defining our roadmap. And that other 10% are things that we're trying to invent on behalf of our customers to you know, create services that we see that they're going to need down the roadmap. So that's why uh, Toyota Research Institute you know, chose um, AWS. They actually saw 4x um, speed ups in their uh, data training and simulations using our P3 instances. And um, you know, that basically translates to their business outcome being their training now used to take days and now it's hours to be able to train their machine learning models. Or for example, uh, BMW Group was able to create uh, you know, a scalable um, immersive vehicle experience where they're bringing personalization down to their vehicles. So um, you know, using machine learning services and an AWS data lake, um, they're able to deploy that new user experience and scale that up and down based on customer demand. So this is you know, just not exhausted. This is just an example of some of the business outcomes that we've seen in the market. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and, and happy to get into the questions. So thanks. Great, thanks. And then we're going to uh, turn it over to uh, learn more about kind of the application API layer of all this tech underlying here. So uh, Stephen. 
Sure, uh, thank you. I'm Stephen Power, COO of Emergency Safety Solutions. And I'm really excited to be up here. Uh, I, I love hearing um, what's going on uh, in the background of what has really enabled uh, emergency safety solutions to get to where we are to solve real on-road on -road problems. Um, and so um, I hope that uh, perhaps through my intro, you'll get to see a little bit of practical application of connected vehicle technologies and just how powerful it is. Because at the end of the day, what is connected vehicle? It's communication. And communication is critical to not only user experience, but also to roadway safety. In fact, I would say that the, 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 the best user experience that you can give to someone that you can provide to a customer is the ability to get home safely to their families at night, right? And so um, we're very passionate about that at Emergency Safety Solutions. So let me talk to you about what, uh, what our mission is and, and how that dovetails into this, into this discussion, because I, I think it's really pertinent. Um, every seven minutes in the United States, someone is struck by a moving vehicle slamming into a disabled vehicle. So if any of you have ever been stuck on the side of the road, perhaps you've had a flat tire, uh, you've, been in a, you've been in a crash, you're waiting for help, you run out of gas, whatever the case may be, that's one of the most dangerous places you can possibly be, not only on the road, but in your life. And what we're seeing is, 72,000 people in the United States are, are impacted by these, these types of incidents every year. 15,000 of them are either injured or killed in these incidents. That's 40 people per day. And the sad fact is that these are preventable tragedies. How do we prevent them? Well, it goes back to something very simple. These are not homicides. No one is running into a vehicle on purpose. They're doing it because they don't notice that that vehicle is there to begin with until it's too late to safely respond, right? Well, we have, we have a safety feature built into our cars today that is intended to provide that communication. It's a hazard warning system. We all have hazard lights. The hazard warning system was invented in 1951, 70 years ago, hasn't been innovated on ever since. Uh, it, was, it was developed at a time where we were technologically limited and the best we can do to provide a safety beacon was to flash lights about one or two times per second. That's all we could do back then. Mechanical relays, incandescent bulbs. The problem is, is that that flash frequency, that communication is, has been found over empirical human factor studies over the last several decades to be woefully inadequate in grabbing people's attention to snap them out of distraction, to, and to not only snap them out of distraction, but to also communicate a very high sense of urgency. So what we've done is we've developed a solution that, uh, that we're working with automakers right now to integrate into their vehicles that we call HELP, the Hazard Enhanced Location Protocol. We're, we're leveraging existing hardware that's already in our cars today in lighting and in digital communications. We are not selling a single piece of hardware to our customers. Everything we need to improve these communications is already in every vehicle today. So what are we doing? When you're in one of these disabling situations, the vehicle is essentially placed into emergency mode. We call it help emergency mode. At that point in time, we're communicating, but not, not just one way, we're communicating in two separate ways at the same time simultaneously. Number one, we're kicking up that rate of flash to an emergency flash rate, four to five hertz. Empirical human factor studies, including some that we've done uh, uh, in, in cooperation with Virginia Tech recently, show that a flash rate of four to five hertz, four to five times per second, along with some other factors, is the most effective flash rate that you can put on the road to snap someone out of distraction and pay attention to what's ahead. So that's the first thing, is we're doing lighting communication. Second, Simultaneous to this, we are sending out a digital alert that goes up into a safety cloud that's actually hosted by AWS, so this is a practical application, and is then propagated back down to people's head units in their vehicles, their uh, uh, cell phone navigation apps like Waze and Google Maps and the like, and also, under, depending on the event type, can be also be shared further to roadside assistance, tow truck resources, emergency responder resources and the like. Let me go to the next slide. So this is what it looks like on paper. Um, the, the, little, the, the car there, the little yellow car, is in emergency mode. It's had a disabling event. That digital communication is going up into that cloud that you see. It says safety cloud. 
That cloud was built by our digital communications partner, Hoss Alert, uh, several, year, several years back. And what it does is it receives alerts of all types. It receives alerts currently. Um, there are, I think, they have about 800 emergency responder fleets all across the country that are sending alerts into this cloud uh, that then oncoming drivers or drivers who are driving into the path of an emergency vehicle, they get the alert through their head unit in their vehicle or through Waze and other navigation apps to let them know that that danger is ahead. There's also a lot of infrastructure that is starting to, to flow into this cloud today. We've got lane change signs and, and, and traffic gates that are all communicating digitally into this cloud for the purposes of being disseminated back down to on oncoming drivers as well as other infrastructure clouds that use that data further. What we're doing is, is we, are, we are, when you deploy help, we're using that same cloud. So now, when you are in a disabled situation, let's say Ted is driving a mile behind me and we're on a highway. I've had a flat tire or, or some other problem, I'm disabled. We, uh, we activate help, and when help is activated, the first thing that Ted gets is he's going to see an alert. Let's say he's using Waze as an example. Disabled vehicle, half a mile ahead. Now Ted is aware that there's a problem coming up. That's alert number one. Then when he gets into line of sight, boom, highly conspicuous lighting. You know exactly where that vehicle is so that you can then slow down and safely navigate around. And it's in doing this, if you look at the efficacy of lighting, and digital communications working, one, working together, it's a massive impact. The lighting alone has an efficacy of anywhere from 30 to 60%. So you, we can reduce crashes just by doing the lighting by 30 to 60%. On top of that, there was actually a study that just came out last week from Purdue University that they did a study of hard braking events. And what they found was is if you give them digital alerts of these types, you can reduce hard braking incidents by 80%. That's a statistically significant sample size that they use, peer reviewed, it's science. So if you take and you multiply the effect of those two together, we can save an awful lot of lives. And so that's exactly what we're doing right now with the automakers. We're also working in the commercial vehicle space right now with last mile delivery carriers uh, and the like. We're all moving toward adopting this completely agnostic uh, 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 cloud structure. And by the way, beyond help in this safety case, as we roll this out, this is the first true agnostic digital communication between two vehicle makes in industry history. And isn't it about time for that? Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so we're going to kind of open this up more uh, questions um, for kind of the panel here. Um, and so kind of uh, from Roger on the connectivity data side and, and Harman and also more perspectives, I'm sure. Luke, AWS and kind of solutions, underlying things. Uh, Steven kind of seeing a lot more of the application experience. Um, and myself kind of the innovation edge, um, invested in over 100 startups, like what's the next, next, next type thing? Um, I, I think, Steven, you had a, a great point when you talked about coming home safely. safely. Um, and that probably being like the unifying thing across all these things is unlike your phone or TV, once you're in a software controlled car, it's all about safety. Um, what to, I was actually going to turn it over to Roger. I wanted to touch on your point. Um, Roger, you'd mentioned the, the, the inverse of safety, like all the hackers out there, security. What do you, how do you think about that problem? Because it's an enormous problem. It's not just one automotor maker's problem. It's like a universal problem. Um, what do you, yeah, anything you want to highlight in that area? So I, I think what I would highlight is right now it seems to be not top of mind for consumers and the automakers. Sure, the, the automakers are protecting their walled gardens, they're delivering their content, their services, and using the enterprise uh, cybersecurity to, to take care of the safety of, of that data. But as we have more connectivity in the car, and I showed a picture there of all the different uh, sources, they could be other cars, they could be devices in the car, they could be um, uh, roadside units or, or clouds. There's going to be a need to be able to control what comes in, to be able not only to, um, to sense when there's an aberration or, or some kind of a data breach, but uh, really take, uh, take action quickly. Imagine you're driving to work, you're out here on I-75 and all of a sudden your car stops, you get a, a, a blue screen on your head unit that says, 
you've been cyber hacked. Uh, if you want to get your car back, it's going to cost you $10,000 in, in um, cryptocurrency. There you sit on I-75 saying, what the heck do I do? So it's really going to be up to the automakers and their electronics uh, uh, suppliers as well as uh, uh, the software suppliers to put together a veil of protection that can be bumper to bumper and bumper to cloud, bumper to edge to make sure that you can inter interdict these kinds of threats because when the first one happens and makes the evening news, and it will, it's not a matter of if, it's when, this is going to be a, a tragedy and people are not really paying attention to it right now. So at Harman, we've been looking at this for some time. Uh, we've had a security organization uh, uh, in Harman called TowerSec uh, that is uh, firewall protection uh, security. That business is being expanded to take a look at all the other attack surfaces, including privacy, because obviously there's going to be a lot of private data, uh, least of which important is going to be your location. Who wants some strange person out there that's it's up to no good to know where you're, you're going, where you go normally, and, and be able to uh, take advantage of that? So we have to protect the privacy as well and protect the automakers from that exposure. So that's, that's essentially what needs to happen. We need to have what we call automotive grade cybersecurity. It's, it's got to be beyond what you see in the industrial grade, beyond what you see in consumer grade. Would, would you say automotive grade is stronger than financial grade, or is it just the, it's, yeah, how would you compare that? So uh, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I think both are important. In the case of financial, it may not involve the safety of people as it does in cars. So I think they're probably on the same level of, of importance. But um, uh, yeah, it, it's something we need to get to very quickly. By, incidentally, by delivering this from the edge, we can essentially make it a much tighter security than if it were just a piece of software running in the car like you have on your, on your PC. It really needs to be tight. It really needs to be authenticated um, uh, security, really like a, like a VPN that's delivered from the edge. So when we look at like kind of the in-car experience around safety and security, um, if we use kind of the analogy of, uh, of the iPhone, Apple's whole approach was we need to control this through an app store, uh, which is not perfect because there's plenty of ways to hack into it, um, but taking a very opinionated approach to your communication device. Um, when we look at kind of the automotive makers making vehicles, um, I guess kind of one more question um, on the, for Roger, but how do you see that evolving around um, being able to control it top to bottom versus there's a lot of connected pieces and so your security relies on someone else's security um, and the whole chain can break down in ways that are not manageable even by maybe your connection point. There needs, needs to be a, an area of, of expertise, a, a competence center that takes care of that last mile security and, and can recognize when threats are coming in or when there has been something that's gotten around when there's an aberration and there needs to also be uh, the ability to uh, quickly uh, recover from that. So, for example, you can't go out to your server and rebuild your car while you're sitting out there on, on the interstate. You need to have something that can quickly rebuild from where you were maybe two, three minutes before so you can get up and going, and then you can go to the dealer. So it, it really is going to depend upon uh, you know, somebody to own that last mile, that last uh, in-vehicle experience uh, from from a security's perspective as well. And I want to jump to Stephen, kind of the last mile there. So um, with you guys, with your help system, hazard lights, what about from like a security side? How do you know what, what's, what's true, what's not true? What might be being infiltrated there from a malicious person? Sure, and for us, we, have, we are not involved in the, the back end security of what we do. So for us, it was all about uh, selecting a partner, a technology partner who uh, built a cloud that's already on road. Uh, the cloud, actually our partner's cloud was built in part through collaboration with the Department of Homeland Security. It's built in AWS with all of those protocols, et cetera. So as we vetted um, our, our cloud partner, we wanted to make sure that it was gonna, that it's a robust cloud. It wasn't just something that somebody in a basement came up with, uh, which is why we were so uh, thrilled to, uh, to be connected with, with Hostler. Um, but within the car, um, I think that the security is inherent to the vehicle's uh, system. So in other words, when you activate help, the interactions are sort of between the body control module, the head unit, um, and, uh, and, and the modem architecture. Those, those uh, pieces have inherent security protocols that, are out, that lie outside of ESS's control. We simply are an application to use 
uh, to use that architecture. So, uh, uh, frankly, we, I hate to say it, but we probably get, get a bit of a pass on that piece for sure. Uh, because we rely on the automakers to, to, to maintain their security. Um, and then, like I said, the only other piece that we can semi-control is, well, what happens with the communication of that information as it passes through the OEM's cloud and is either connected through API to the safety cloud or if the safety cloud is embedded in that cloud. That's where, for us, it was, it was, sort of a, it, it was really a sort of a vendor partner uh, vetting process for us to ensure uh, that, uh, that, that we were partnering with, with folks that that, that had done that diligence and, and are maintaining that level of security. Uh, that makes sense. So um, if it's kind of a, someone else's fault, um, is, it, is it potentially Amazon's fault? And kind of switching over to Luke. Yes. Um, it may not be Amazon, though, because uh, if we look at just what happened to Intel and the chips being hacked, and so Amazon has its own infrastructure it relies on, and then groups like BMW build on it or Safety Cloud builds on it. And so now how low can you go till like, the entire thing falls apart? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So at, at, at AWS, um, you know, security is job number one for us. So obviously you have to make sure that the infrastructure that you're running on is secure, which is why we employ a, you know, a, a large team of the, you know, the best security professionals in the industry. Uh, you know, we have 24-7 monitoring of all of our systems. And uh, when it comes to actually application security, we have our shared responsibility model, right? So uh, AWS really focuses on the security um, of the cloud itself. So those components, those services that are um, you know, being enabled, the physical infrastructure, obviously, that uh, you know, the cloud services are running on. But we also you know, obviously rely on uh, the partners and the implementation as well. So whoever is actually deploying those solutions to make sure that they're leveraging you know, the best in class security, they're making sure that they're encrypting their data, uh, you know, we enable those services to make sure that the data is protected and making sure that you know, uh, we, we have a secure posture against uh, any you know, attack surfaces. So. You know, we've been looking at this as well from an authentication perspective. And I think the original question you asked, Stephen, was how do you know it's real? Um, there is going to have to be an authentication layer when we start to get into these kinds of systems that is encrypted, that, that provides a key that says, the, the message coming in is authentic from that vehicle. Otherwise, all the systems can be um, corrupted by you know, rogue operators. Um, I wanted to make another point uh, to follow up on Stephen's uh, safety system, which I think is uh, tremendous. Um, there's also a need for that in pedestrians. And we've been looking at something that was on the first, uh, second slide I showed, which is called VRU, which stands for Vulnerable Road User System. If you can imagine, it's like V2X for pedestrians. So it, it's mainly to communicate to the vehicle that there's a pedestrian uh, you know, that's potentially vulnerable, standing between cars or, or otherwise uh, invisible. But uh, the information is passed from the pedestrian's uh, uh, telephone, mobile phone, uh, through the cloud and directly to uh, the vehicle head unit. It can be done vice versa as well, but most pedestrians don't, well, maybe not today, don't sit and walk down the road watching for alerts where in the car you'll hear the alerts. So, the, the idea is to be able to provide that kind of uh, safety mechanisms for pedestrians as well as, of course, uh, two-wheel uh, bicycle users, and that's something that's coming down the pipe as well. So kind of switching gears a little bit, so security being a huge underlying thing around the in-vehicle experience as more things are connected. Um, wanna maybe, I want to also talk about privacy, but before that, um, what about all the cool things that happen? So once everything's connected, like what are those like, wow, that is amazing. Um, and maybe starting with Steven, just knowing uh, anytime I drive and I hear sirens, I'm like, where is this coming from? Just little things like that. But if you want to talk about kind of the, the benefits, just the, the enhanced user experience just from that side. Yeah, I, I want to try to take that in, in two prongs. Uh, first thing, kind of, kind of speaking to that sort of that siren issue, right? One of the benefits of utilizing um, digital architecture for communication is that it takes a lot of ambiguity out of communication. Okay, so if uh, it, it take your example, uh, uh, an emergency vehicle is approaching you with a siren, you're, you may, depending on where you are, you may perceive that to be coming from your right when it's actually coming from your left because there's echoes. Whereas if you, if, and, and so therefore your awareness is one that is so ambiguous that you actually have to process it and figure out as the driver where it's coming from. Same thing for some of the systems that are coming out in cars that use microphones. That's one of their te technological obstacles is trying to figure out trajectory, right? So the beauty of taking things into the cloud and utilizing, uh, uh, frankly, location-based uh, uh, alerts and, and services of, of that type is 
that is unambiguous. You have a location, you have a lat long, you have a trajectory, the, the, uh, 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 even an, aut an autonomous vehicle, the AI doesn't need to interpret that. It's, 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 a, given, it's a given input. Um, uh, we've seen other, we've seen other uh, ambiguous communications come through uh, recently. I mean, uh, uh, if you've read the articles, uh, NHTSA's investigations into, into, into um, autopilot uh, pro, uh, um, uh, vehicles, those vehicles are relying on, on visual technology. And even the ones that aren't using cameras, they are, they're, using other, they're using other line of sight type of uh, techniques. And the AI has to then interpret, is that a truck or is that an overpass or is that a human being or a cat, right? Whereas the more of that information that we can digitize and, and use sort of that mapping uh, uh, perspective, you take all that ambig ambiguity out, everything is marked, everything's understood. So, um, so that point one is, uh, I think the user experience is enhanced by our communications uh, being cleaned and cleansed. So taking the ambiguity out, right? And, and it's all enabled by, by a lot of these connected vehicle communications. The second piece is, um, you know, I've, 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 I have sat in on these panels before in the past. Uh, I bet you if we go back five years ago, there was a panel similar to this and many of them where everybody, you know, you see a lot of slideware, right? And we're all like, man, it's gonna be so cool one day when all these cars are talking to each other and here's all the cool things we can do about it. And then of course the accountants come in and they're like, and we can monetize it, right? I challenge the automotive industry, all of us, to take our minds off of that big picture. I'm not saying to, to throw away vision. I'm just saying don't let it paralyze us. We have the technology we need to, we have to, that we need today to solve real problems, many of them involving safety, but also user experience. We have the technology. We're trying to boil the ocean. Let's put solutions out there and build on, on each other. I mean, as we've implemented, as, as we've worked to implement help, we have uncovered other adjacent and congruent use cases. So many cool things that it's like, man, we almost have to shut it out. Like, I mean, too many shiny objects. But just by doing, just by implementing help, we're triggering new ideas, other things that we can put, other communications we could put across the same pipeline. Because to solve our problem, we had to build a pipeline, right? Well, the pipeline's built. What else do you want to put across it? And I argue that rather than trying to perfect everything and figure out how the pie is going to get cut up, frankly, before we make move one, let's generate value. Let's solve discrete problems. We will build to that. The internet didn't become what it is today because someone master planned it all. It started with a couple of informational web pages, right? And then everything layered up, and guess what? The vision that everybody could probably see at some point, at least some version of it, it came to reality. But it only came to reality not because of the planning and not because of all the what one day, think about how cool this is going to be. It, it was by solving simple problems. So, uh, so I, I think that the user experience is coming. I think that we have the tech that we need to not only make our cars safer, but make them actually talk to each other. Like every other thing in, in our world, including our cell phones, airplanes, boats, everything talks to each other except for cars. We're gonna get there. The technology is cool. We can make it slick. We can make it seamless. We can make it aesthetically pleasing, right? But we're never gonna get anywhere near it until we, until we really start building on the solutions that we have at hand. And with the confidence of knowing, look, we're talking about primarily, there's a lot of cloud solutions out here in, the, in, these connect, in this connected vehicle space. Here's the beauty of it. Clouds can integrate with one another. They're compatible. So let's go out and build, and, 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 and I, think that, um, I think the user experience will follow. I want to jump over to Roger for user experience. So Harman being kind of the stuff you see and, and touch and hear in your vehicle, what are kind of some of the cool things you're seeing that you can talk about just around kind of the, the evolution of the cockpit and the driver, the passenger, what their experience is like? So uh, we've been uh, seeing a lot of uh, uh, development in the user interface, really doing deep down studies of you know, what moves users, what, it's, it's not just functional, it's emotional. And we've been using displays, uh, surround displays. We've been processing sound to complement the surround displays and coming up with uh, virtual reality applications which can be actually projected in the windshield as a non-distractive sort of, uh, you know, experience. 
Um, I think, though, we will see a transformation from what we know today in vehicles where you, know, you have a driver that's operating something and, and these experiences can be distracting to one where the car can operate itself and you can really build those experiences uh, regardless of, of distraction and making sure that uh, you're still safe in the car as it, as it moves along. One of the things that's going to be important to, um, in connectivity is to be able to create what we call situational awareness for an autonomous vehicle and not just having LIDARs and cameras and things in your own vehicle, but actually merging sensors from other vehicles to provide a much more robust situational awareness and, and eventually arriving at, at something we call level five autonomy where, you know, your car will be a living room or it'll be an office or it'll be a, um, you know, another space that you'll use. And so we're thinking about the car as spaces and thinking what can we do with a space that will either improve your entertainment, improve your productivity, or improve your comfort. And that's the directions we're going at Armin. And I think that, Roger, on that point, there was, a, I think it was a Lincoln ad, uh, I saw an, uh, a Lincoln uh, vehicle ad, and it's like your, your second office is in your driveway. And I was just talking about that, and I was like, that's a really interesting way to think about your vehicle. Um, you want to uh, jump over to Luke. So it's not just about the, the experience for the end user, but it's the the groups that are building those experiences, how does Amazon kind of think about enabling developers to make more immersive experiences? Because that's a big part of the puzzle. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And you know, part of my role at, at AWS is actually enabling our, uh, our partners. And AWS is a, uh, you know, the, the, the large partner network, and that's really what we leverage, is we're trying to enable all those different independent software vendors and different system integrators to be able to build their solutions. And you know, we focused a lot, like I mentioned just briefly, the um, ADAS and AV uh, ML Ops and development program. So we're basically really focused on trying to provide those tools, uh, you know, enabling the network, uh, you know, with, with all those different, you know, the data lake solution that they can go take and build and, and, and create from. And we're seeing really innovative solutions come out of that. So, you know, you talk about what we're excited about. Um, you know, the things that I see are just super exciting right now, first to be in the auto industry. Uh, but we're seeing new innovations in, obviously, ADAS and AV, where we're seeing, uh, you know, new applications of uh, teleoperation. And, using some of the new 5G technologies that were out there, um, AWS has, has deployed Wavelength, which is our, uh, our 5G mech, which allows a lot of new use cases um, that are enabled for um, you know, um, V to X and, and V to V, to v communications. So we're, we're basically right now just trying to focus on accelerating that development and uh, really you know, just fueling that ecosystem, making sure that we have the right tools in place so that the, uh, you know, the creators and the inventors can go out and build uh, you know, their point solutions. So as we kind of have a few minutes here for the panel, um, so we talked about kind of security um, at, um, underlying all this. We have this experience of the operator driving the vehicle, the passengers, the surroundings. Is all this secure? But then ultimately the other side of all this coin is the privacy. To make it more secure, more personalized, you have to know more about the individual. Um, and we're not going to solve this in five minutes here, um, but just kind of curious your perspectives from each of your organizations. Like, how does that come into play, or does it even come into play? And maybe starting with Stephen, ultimately, if you're in an accident or you're pulling over, like, you're trading your privacy for help and safety. Yeah, um, and, and, there, and there is a push and uh, push and push and take on that, right? Um, you know, in an ideal world, and technologically speaking, we can accomplish all of this. Um, let's say you're in a, an event where your airbag's deployed, right? So help will, you know, will, uh, the lights go off, digital communications go off, folks, folks approaching you are getting alerts in their vehicles and in their nav apps, um, and um, emergency responder networks can be notified. The richer the data that you have available to you, the better that response can be, right? So. Uh, so in other words, if you, if you could associate with that vehicle, well, uh, this is a female age 54, has a heart problem and diabetes, that would be very useful information to send along with the VIN number and all kinds of rich information. The fact of the matter is, though, is getting to that point, there are security concerns uh, that, that, uh, that, that play against that. Uh, so from an ESS perspective, what we're focused on first, uh, although we would love to get there, um, what we're focused on first is to be able to notify the event and um, in terms of uh, 
uh, personal information. We're not even going down to the VIN number or so, so that you can't, you can't identify if it's a Ford or a Toyota or what have you. But we are, we are sending out um, event type, so it is very important to know if there's an airbag deployment or a flat tire or if they're just out of gas or whatever it may be because that, that actually influences the, the rules and the routing of that information. Uh, so maybe maybe one more time I get a, I get a little bit of a pass and get to kind of uh, slip away, but uh, but but it is it is of concern because we would love for that the richer that information the better um, and uh, it just just if, if any of you want to come out and, and take a look at what we've got uh, we have a, one of our demo vehicles is here we're out in uh, Pod Two which is in between Nissan and Mazda out on the test track come by you can't miss this you'll see a car flashing its lights like crazy. Um, and if you have any, any uh, technical questions or what have you, how we're making this happen, please swing by. We can talk through it. We can talk about security and, and how the data flows. Uh, but thank you. And then, uh, Luke, from a privacy side, since you guys are uh, more powering a lot of these techs from the automotive side, how, does that come into play just from Amazon's how it thinks about privacy when applications are built on applications? Yeah, privacy is a, you know, a very important topic, and uh, you know, it's something that we try to enable with the, the tools that we have available. Um, you know, you were speaking of the, the identification of you know, personal identifiable information. We actually have a service that can go out and help identify, you know, users can run to, to in their accounts to understand if there's any personally identifiable information that's available there. And um, you know, really just uh, enabling um, you know, the tool set again too, so that our customers and the solutions that they end up uh, providing can be very private. Um, you know, from an AWS perspective and a cloud perspective, it's really important to understand that the tools that we have enable encryption, right? So that data at rest, as well as the data in transit, the whole encryption chain can be enabled and controlled by our customers, so they can actually encrypt all of the data. Um, the data, it, it, if it's fully encrypted, isn't viewable, right, by, by anyone if it gets intercepted. Um, you know, the data that's in the cloud in AWS is is secured. It's our customers' data. You know, we don't have access to that data, so obviously that that's private data um, for the end end user. So we're trying to enable those different tools, um, you know, those encryption technologies, and uh, you know, really just enabling um, you know privacy from the core. So. And what's that tool you mentioned? There's a tool where I could go on and see if my data is being used in databases. Uh, so that's a, a, an AWS service. So okay. if you're an AWS uh, consumer, there's actually a, a tool that we have, AWS Macy, that you can actually run inside your AWS account, and it will actually go and try to look for areas where there's personal identifiable information for customers that potentially you may not know about, right? You have some developer that maybe is, has a database that they're securing somewhere or has you know, a file that happens to be in one of their cloud d data stores. So helping to go out and actually identify that information to help protect their customers and you know, help secure their privacy. Okay, so this is from a developer going in to make sure someone else doesn't have their right. data exposed on the backside. Yep. Gotcha. And then uh, over to Roger, kind of final thing around kind of the, the privacy side with you guys in the car, cameras, microphones, how do you guys think about that? So I, it, it's going to be important that consumers understand that the amount of information that they convey to the service providers is going to be proportional to the kind of, uh, of optimized experience they're going to have. They need to have control of that. So as we're putting together these, um, these security mechanisms that are going to protect privacy, it's going to be up to the consumer to say, I'm going to configure it you know, the way that I want it for me. And I know that if I allow more personalized information out, uh, I'll get you know, more personalization in the car. So it, it's sort of a, you know, a trade-off. And so it's going to be important that, that the consumer own their privacy to some ex extent and be able to protect themselves. Great. Well, we just have a, one minute here, so kind of a, a last kind of lightning question. Um, what would be kind of um, over the next five to ten years, something from your perspective around connected vehicles, autonomy, electric shared, um, what, what's kind of something that either like really scares you or really excites you about what's possible? I'm going to just kind of leave it open-ended, just curious. We'll take first step on that one. Uh, it, what concerns me is a hybrid uh, driving environment where you've got you know, autonomous vehicles and you've got people-operated vehicles. How do you arbitrate between the two? I think at this point in time, you know, we, we all look at, as you said, that, that nirvana in the future. Everybody gets into their car that drives up to pick them up and, and takes them to where they want to go, hands off, they watch a movie. But there's going to be a period that's going to be transitionary where you're going to have the bad drivers on I-96 along with the trucks that are automated. And that, that really scares me. 
So I, I'm a bit of an optimist here, and I have to do this because I'm a parent. So um, the thing that really excites me about this is when I see my kids growing up and their interaction with our vehicle, right? So uh, you know, driving a vehicle that has these ADAS features, they look at this thing also almost as it's like an oracle or it's some you know magic, right? It's uh, it's an autonomous system. It can basically do anything. Um, so that you know, looking at it from their eyes, the new technology that's there, you know, the safety aspect of this as well. Like, you know, Stephen's hitting this really heavily. Um, you know, just thinking about the amount of new safety features, the new ADAS features that are going to be available in future vehicles five, ten years down the line, um, just makes me you know, overwhelmingly optimistic about everything. So, you know, and also, uh, you know, downside to that too is obviously we're going to have a lot more, uh, you know, potential distractions. We need to execute in that. And again, I just mentioned, you know, my, my children's situation. Um, you know, there's the reality of that, right? Expectations of what you're getting into, you know, what level of autonomy you're actually operating at so yeah. um, I'm, I'm optimistic I think that uh, the avalanche has begun um, uh, ESS is living proof of that we're connecting vehicles today it's on the road and I think that now now that that first step is to, has been taken that it's gonna build and build and, and I am an optimist although I am a little bit old school my, my twin sons uh, turned 17 years old today but in last year for their first car I made them share a car uh, so that they wouldn't run two car two of my cars into each other uh, I got them a manual transmission, so I'm pretty old school, but at the same time, I, um, I, I am optimistic about the future. I think that we're going to figure all this out. I think that as we actually get, as we increase this level of communication, we're enabling the ability for, uh, for autonomy. Um, and, and although I can't ever see myself ever wanting to be driven by a car because I'm a, an enthusiast, um, um, I, I think we're going to get there. And, uh, and, and I agree with you. I think the bigger challenge is going to be in that transition of mixed use because uh, fleet replacement will take a long time. Uh, we, can, we can start producing only autonomous vehicles today, and you're still, it's going to take 12 years before you know, uh, existing vehicles kind of work their way through the system. So we're going to need to be careful. We're going to need to take, take it step by step. But honestly, we have so much technology. We have so much talent, so much energy behind solving these problems that uh, I'm optimistic that, uh, that 10 years from now we're sitting in here. I don't even know what we're going to be talking about, to be honest with you. It's, it's you know, may, maybe like nobody will even be thinking about the, auto, the the automotive industry anymore. It's just some tool that we have. Uh, like there aren't any conferences for, you know, bedroom furniture and couches, right? Uh, I actually see that coming one day. Yeah, and I, the one thing I see that I don't know, pessimistic, optimistic, or just kind of investor had is actually quantum computing. And so quantum computing changes the entire um, security layer. And so. I was reading a really interesting article where if one of those existed today, everything's hackable in nanoseconds. And so now the entire, everything has to be rethought and rebuilt, but you're rebuilding something for something that no one knows how it works. And so it, it's fascinating that building for the future, securing today, but tomorrow's future could be so much stronger than today. Um, it's, it's an arms race, but it's, it's fascinating to see all the developments here. Um, and so from the investor hat, I've been looking at interesting quantum stuff. Who knows? It's just all fuzzy right now, and I guess that's an implied dad joke. Um, but uh, that said, thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, we'll be up here. Thank you.